Welcome to the ninth of our 20 classes going through the book of Revelation. And I think as we go through this section today, uh, just entering into the fourth and fifth chapters of Revelation, you're going to see why this book was the most popular of all the books of the Bible to the early church. Uh, the sequence is significant. We've been looking at the church on earth. Then we're going to soon be going into the wrath of God poured out on earth. But between those two is the church in heaven. And what I've entitled this section is connected to the most powerful place in the universe. Now, if you see the slide in front of you, that's what many of us think of when we think of grandeur and power. It's a, it's a huge spiral galaxy. Literally, as we look at the book of Revelation discussing the end of the world, the most peaceful, assuring place of confidence for anyone to be when they think they're, they're going through the tribulation, which is what the early church felt. They were being hunted down and martyred, which is how it's described in the tribulation. All believers are going to be hunted down and martyred. And so they saw this middle section of the connection to the throne of God to be the most peaceful, uh, hope-filled concept they could have. So let's read uh, just the opening of the fourth chapter of Revelation, if you can get there in your Bibles. And then let's pray that the Lord will help us to realize why the most commanded part of our Christian life do you remember what that is? What's the only thing we're supposed to do without ceasing? What is it? Yeah, pray without ceasing. Prayer is how we get connected to the most powerful place in the universe, the throne of God, where we see ourselves already surrounding that throne. But look at this in chapter 4. After these things, do you see the juncture here? Chapter 3 ended with the church on earth, Laodicea. And then chapter four, verse one says, after these things. Now the whole book of Revelation is like, remember class one, it's like a movie script. It's like a shooting sequence of a movie where it follows. It, it's not like this is out of order. This is a beautiful chronological view from now to forever. So after these things marks this juncture, I looked, remember John is being taken on tour, so he's the eye, the apostle John. I looked and behold, a door was standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard, going back to chapter one, remember he was on Patmos in the prison colony in the Roman Empire, and on the Lord's day he heard a voice behind him. See, it's the same voice, so it's the voice of the Lord, which I heard like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. After the church on earth, the church is in heaven. It's, it's, it's a sequence, and we're going to see that all the way through. Well, that starts with um, verse 2. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. God is on the throne. God is our Heavenly Father. And when we are connected to him, we're connected to the throne of God, which is the center of everything going on in the universe. Let's pray and ask the Lord to guide us. Lord, I thank you that right now, uh, just by bowing our hearts before you, just by approaching your throne in the name of Jesus, we're instantly connected to the center, the, the power center, the ruling center, your throne. Oh, Lord, thank you for being our Father in heaven. And you call your throne the throne of grace and mercy, where we can find grace to help us in our time of need. How the early church lived that out. How we want to, as we are in ever-darkening days, how we want to live connected to your throne, to you as our Heavenly Father. In the name of Jesus, we ask for that. Amen. Well, as we, as we go through the book of Revelation, remember it has 404 verses in those 22 chapters. 
Every one of the verses tie back to all the rest of the Bible. And as we get into this section, chapters 4 and 5, we see so much of the tie back to our Lord Jesus Christ's ministry. But let's begin, number one, with that door. See in, in verse 2, standing open in verse 2. I was in the Spirit and I saw this throne looking through the door that it talks about in verse 1. What John is learning is heaven is a real place existing at this moment. It's not like someday, uh, after everything's over, finally heaven will start. No, heaven exists and chapter 1, Jesus comes from heaven and appears to John. So heaven is a place right at this moment. And these next two chapters, chapter 4 and chapter 5 that we study, gives us a sight of what's going on in heaven. Now, the message to John was that heaven was real even though he was on that island, a prisoner, ill-treated, not even knowing if he was going to ever get off that island. And, and what the Lord showed him is, while his whole world was this horrible uh, time of persecution, continuously going on at the same time as his persecution was all the worship that we see in these two chapters. It's, it's kind of like uh, when you fly above a storm. Uh, my wife and I flew 100 and, 130 or 40,000 miles in the last 12 months. And as I think about many of the hours on those planes, we would look down and see the dark clouds and the kind of like flash bulbs going off of thunderstorms. So down seven miles or six miles below us, there were storms going on and, and people uh, wondering where those lightning bolts were going to hit and, and wondering if they were going to get flooded and wondering with all the storm going on. But we were up there and sometimes while we were seeing storms blow us, we could see stars out the window of the airplane. And it's almost like while the storm is going on, there's this place of calm above it. That's exactly what John was shown. It's the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Above all else, that's what this book is about. So no matter what your take on the book. Now remember, good, good believers uh, have all different views of revelation. There's the covenant theology view, which is it's just a historic record of the fall of Jerusalem and kind of like a narrative that God's going to win in the end, but none of those details are literal. Then there's the dispensational view, which I'm teaching you, that all of this is really going to happen. But don't let your perspective of this book keep you from the message that it's the revelation of Jesus Christ helping us in the church right now on earth, watching over and receiving the worship in heaven, overseeing the righting of all wrongs, that's what the tribulation is, coming back, now every Christian agrees on that, the 19th chapter they all agree on, it's the return of Christ. His rule on the earth, again we get into all different views on that, the final judgment, all believers agree on that, heaven, all believers agree on that. So we all believe the church is on earth. We believe the church is in heaven. We believe he's going to right all wrongs. He's coming back. He's going to give everyone what they deserve, and we are going to get to dwell with him forever. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, real quickly, as we talk about worship, now remember, um, when, when you read, starting in verse 3, it starts describing this throne of Revelation 4, 3. Verse 4, around the throne are 24 elders. They have these crowns. Verse 5, uh, from the throne proceed lightnings and thunders and voices and, and all of this description. Now look at verse 8. See, this, the atmosphere of heaven is worship. Do you see how it says that uh, they don't rest night and day saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who is, who was, and who is to come. Do you see that, that atmosphere of worship? That immediately brings us to this slide. Who are these worshipers that are around the throne? How do you get around the throne? How do you get to heaven? See, that's, that's really what this book is all about. That's why it was so popular. It explains everything. Let me take you back to answer that to Philippians 3.3 3 because, and that's, you go by, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. There we go. Next page, Philippians chapter 3. Look at verse 3. 
For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Who are true worshipers? The Apostle Paul says people that have a circumcised heart. Do you remember what uh, a couple days ago I was telling you about uh, the fact that Ezekiel 36 talks about salvation and starting in verse 26 and through 27 it says a new heart I will give you. So a new heart, a new spirit I'll put within you. I take out of you the old stony heart and I put my spirit within you. That's, that's what, what is called the new covenant. The new covenant is what we celebrate at communion. The new testament or covenant that's in my blood. This new heart and new spirit is what this circumcision, Paul said, for we are the circumcision. This is surgical transformation of the inner part of us. He wasn't talking about the physical sign of the covenant of the Jews. He said they think that physical external circumcision gets them into the kingdom of God. He says actually what God says is I want to circumcise your heart, not your body. See this new heart we get, which is the new covenant, is what Paul says. See Philippians 3.3. 3. How do you know you're the ones that have the right circumcision? Because you worship God in the spirit, Philippians 3.3, 3, rejoice in Christ Jesus and don't have confidence in your flesh. That's what it takes away, the old, hard, do it my own way, going our, our own way, like Isaiah 53 says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We go to our own way. That's our flesh. That's our old heart. So the true worshipers are those who worship God in the spirit. Um, Revelation 4 and 5 shows us a future picture of all true believers gathered in heaven as the true worshipers of God, worshiping at the highest level. Now, we worship here on earth. I mean, we just enjoyed, Bonnie and I, in our sheltering at home, enjoyed watching Grace Community Church, uh, where we were on staff way back in the 80s with John MacArthur. And we watched that service and sang along with them and worshiped with them. And then we went to Central Park by way of the television and, and watched Franklin Graham speak. And then uh, we also were participating in other services and singing along with other believers. Now, that's wonderful worship, but that's earthly worship. And we have distractions. I mean, even while I was sitting and watching, my phone is buzzing and you know what I mean? And the the heater is going on and off and they're all different distractions but what we see in heaven is unhindered focused glorified worship what's heavenly worship like well those in heaven are unhindered by time they're not bothered by their flesh they're not distracted they're completely focused directly on the lamb and what are they doing look look what it says in revelation 4 i love this I'll never forget the first time I taught through this, uh, decades ago, I was speaking in a church that had a main floor and a balcony, and I started saying, and that's how they worship in heaven, and all of a sudden I saw this elderly man get out of his chair, and he disappeared. And I found out later that when he saw in Revelation that they, verse 10 of chapter 4, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and cast their crowns. One of the elders told me later, he was in the balcony, that this gentleman first got out of his chair, then he got on his knees, and then he actually laid his head down on his hands on the floor. And he said, if that's how God is worshiped in heaven, I want to start doing it today. Think what it means to be unhindered by any distraction, focused on the Lamb, bowing in front of His throne. And most of all, each of those we see in chapters 4 and 5 are glorified. Now, glorified means, finally, we're transformed into sinlessness. Now, never on earth are we sinless. We're always struggling with the world that's trying to distract us, our flesh that's trying to entice us, and the devil that's trying to devour us. And we're always struggling with that, not in heaven. 
no more are there humannesses that, that weaken us or sin or the devil to interfere any way with our worship. It's worship at the highest level. And that's what we see. So that leads us to this question. So what kind of worship does God accept? Now, Jesus already commented on that. Remember, every part of the book of Revelation harkens back to somewhere else. Look at John chapter 4, because Jesus has already weighed in on what worship is that is acceptable to God. In John chapter 4 in your Bible, and verse 24, says this, uh, God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him, look at this, in spirit and in truth. What that means is that the only way to truly worship God is to have this new heart. That's when we get the Holy Spirit within us. Our Paul says that we are dead in our trespasses and sin. We walk according to our father, the devil, the course of the God of this world. But when we get saved, this new covenant event right here, this spiritual heart surgery, gives us a new heart and the Holy Spirit moves within and that makes it possible for us to even worship. Now I have my cell phone here and this, this wonderful electronic device wears out in about a day of heavy use or about a day and a half of light use. And it has right here the charging port. Now, of course, it also can have that, I don't even know how the one, the cordless one works, but I can charge it, but I have to put it either connected with a cord or put it in its cradle to recharge it. Because without the power, it doesn't work. It's just a kind of a heavy, expensive object but it doesn't function. Without a new heart, we can't worship God. So Jesus said this, biblical worship always has three elements. Think about everything you know in the Bible about worship. Every time worship is portrayed in the Bible, it has these three elements of chapter four, verse 24. The person that's offering the worship, that's number one. It, it's, they're, they're, worship is not music, it's something a person offers. Now, worship is a part of it. Communion is a part of it, but communion is not worship. Preaching is not worship. Singing is not worship. Listening to music is not worship. Worship is, number one, the person offering the worship. And then the offering that they're bringing. So you have to be the right kind of person. You have to have the right kind of offering. And thirdly, the one they're giving that offering to. See, there's three parts. The person that's the offerer, what they're offering, and who they're sending it to. And look what it says in chapter 4. God is a spirit. That's the one we're offering to. And those who worship, that's the offerer, the person, must worship, listen in spirit and in truth. That's the type. It has to be spiritual worship prompted by a regenerated heart. And it has to be based on what is that other word? In spirit and in what? Truth. That's what makes these two chapters some of the most valuable in the Bible. This describes the worship that's acceptable to God. The content, the lyrics, the focus of what's acceptable to God. These three perspectives are always present in the Bible. And all three elements, the person, the offering, and the one that is being offered to, has to be right or the worship is wrong. And that's what is so clearly presented in these two chapters. And by the way, Romans 12, 1 and 2 says the only way that we can offer worship is to be surrendered. That we may, remember Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's an offering of worship. La tereo, a spiritual service to God. Well, God gives the eternal gospel and it connects to worship. In fact, worship in the Bible is submission to God. Very, very interesting. Let, let me show you what I mean. Turn to Revelation 14, 6, because when we get to um, the 14th chapter, which I can't wait to get to with you, uh, it's kind of like the high point of the tribulation. It's just before Armageddon. There are huge hailstones and the sun is scorching and water is all poisonous. 
And so, uh, and, and the Antichrist is martyring everybody that's a believer. And the two witnesses have come and the 144,000 are out there ministering. But look what the Lord does. He sends a gospel angel preaching. See what it says on your slide? The eternal gospel. Let me read to you. Then I saw another angel. This is Revelation 14, 6. Flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So this is the proclamation of the everlasting gospel, the unchanging gospel, the gospel of God. So God sends a personal representative, this angel, to proclaim to every person on earth. What I see is this angel kind of flying like a, a drone over the surface of the earth. And, and he's just flying around the earth nonstop, beaming down, speaking to every human in every language of every person on earth. And look what he says in verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of judgment has come, and worship him. Worship him. Submit to him. Worship him. Ask him for a new heart. Let his spirit come within you. Worship him. Become one who has a circumcised heart and has the spirit, as Paul said in Philippians 3.3. 3. But look at the one we worship, who made, this verse 7 of chapter 14, heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Isn't it interesting that when God preaches the gospel, the eternal gospel, is submitting to our creator? Wow. That, that's, and worshiping him, offering the worshiper the true worship he wants to the true person that he is, creator. Well, basically, we can say this, that worship or submission to God is the central theme of the Bible. Now go to the very last chapter of the Bible, in your Bible, if you have Revelation 22. And in the very last chapter, it's fascinating, there's one more glimpse at this, this event of, uh, of worshiping God. And basically John is just overwhelmed at everything he's seen. And uh, he starts talking in verse 8 of chapter 22. Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard them, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Now he had had an angel that had been leading him around and taking him to see this and that, and he was asking questions of what that meant and this meant. And so John has been spending time with this angel. And when he finally sees everything going on in heaven and the throne of God, Verse, verse 8 says, I fell before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. And then he said to me, verse 9, see that you do not do that. How do you know if an angel is a pre-incarnate Christophany or Theophany, a pre-incarnate picture of Christ? Rep, you know, it's, it's Christ appearing as an angel. How do you know it's, it's Christ or a, a, just an angel angel? What's the difference? Well, those who are just angels say, don't worship me. They, they won't let you. But whenever you see an angel that receives worship, you know it's Christ, the pre like the commander of the host of the Lord with Joshua, for example, or the one who appeared to Manoah for the birth of Samson. That was the Lord Jesus Christ coming before his incarnation in the form of an angel. So this angel is just a normal angel. And he said, see that you do not do that. For I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. What are the last two words of verse 9? Worship God. See that slide? Worship or submission to God is the central theme of the Bible. The whole Bible is about worship. And that's what the book of Revelation shows us. The church on earth is to be worshiping God. They get to heaven. They spend all their time around the throne worshiping him. God is sending the angel telling those on the earth that if they will submit to God and worship, they can go to heaven. And if they won't, they are going to face his wrath. He comes to be worshiped in the second coming. He sits, Jesus sits 
on a throne in Jerusalem during the millennium and allows the whole world to come and meet him. And then they reject him and they're cast in the lake of fire because they won't submit to him. But all who do submit to him, we get to spend forever in heaven worshiping him. Worship is the central theme of the Bible. The foundations of true biblical worship are, are what we see in chapter four and five. Basically, what chapters four and five do is give us the template, uh, kind of like the framework, uh, the paradigm, what we need to know how to worship God properly. And we see uh, the content of that worship. If you look in, um, starting in chapter four, the wording of these songs, uh, the, the lyrics, we could say, because there are several of these songs list. In fact, there are 14 of them, 14 different uh, worship choruses in heaven. The first one is in verse 8, holy, holy, holy. Uh, the next one is in verse 11 of chapter 4, you are worthy. Uh, the next one is in chapter 5, verse 9. Uh, then it, another one comes in verse 12, and another one comes in verse 13. And so what we see are... The, the actual words, the chorus, the lyrics, which is truly what we could call the foundations of true biblical worship. What does it center on? Well, back to verse two of chapter four, because basically what John is shown, remember John is a prisoner of war in prison. When Jesus shows up to him, reveals his resurrection glory, and then shows him the worship going on in heaven. What's the first thing he sees? Verse 2 of chapter 4, I was in the spirit and there is a throne and one sat on the throne. Now, this draws us back to the Sermon on the Mount. What does it say in Matthew 5? Uh, verse 16. You can see that on, on the slide. Matthew 5 and verse 16. Now we'll go to verse 34. Matthew 5. Let me turn back there with you. Jesus was always pointing people to look at this. Let your light, Matthew 5, 16, so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify what? Your Father in heaven. See, the Father we all need is the one seated on the throne of heaven in Revelation 2 and 3. And as we enter Revelation 4 and 5, we must always remember the best explanation of Scripture is the Scripture. The Reformers called that Analogia Scriptura, the analogy of the Scripture. So let's take some time looking at what does the Scripture say about the Scripture. This is what the scripture says about the scripture. This is what Jesus said about the throne of God in heaven. So the book of Revelation is just kind of collecting into one place what all the rest of the scriptures say about our Father in heaven. Keep going in chapter 5 of Matthew to verse 34. Jesus said this, But I say unto you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. Wow. Look back at the slide on the screen. The Father we all need is the one seated on the throne of heaven. Wow. We, to see the throne of God, most clearly, we have to see it through the lens of all the other times God shows us the throne. Now remember, we see the throne of God several times in the scriptures. Uh, we see the throne of God when Moses in Exodus goes up on the mountain with the elders and they see this, this crystal sea. Then we see the throne again in 1 Kings when Micaiah, the prophet, uh, is standing before Ahab and he says, I see the Lord and all the host of heaven around him. Then we see the throne of God again in the book of Job when Satan is coming and accusing Job. Then a little bit later, we see in Isaiah chapter 6, especially, the throne of God, high and lifted up. Then by the time we get to Ezekiel, we see the actual, what we would call cherubim and seraphim around the throne of God. And then we get to Daniel, 
And wow, we really start seeing the throne of God and more details than are anywhere else in the scripture. And then the next time we see the throne of God, it's right here in Matthew. And there's a lot in the book of Matthew about the throne of God. And basically, we could summarize it this way. Our Father is the one on the throne. Do you see on the slide? Verse 16, we already read. Verse 34, we already read. Keep going to chapter 5, verse 45 of Matthew. And you will be sons of your Father in heaven. So, Father, heaven, the one on the throne. Always think of your Father as the one seated on the throne, the most powerful place in the universe, the command center, the control center of the universe. Wow. Just for a moment, think of the power of the one seated on the throne. He spoke and he made all the stars by just saying for them to come into existence. That one statement is beyond anything we can comprehend. Keep going to chapter 6 of the book of Matthew. Take heed that you do not your charitable deeds to be seen before men. Otherwise, you have no reward from our Father in heaven. Wow. Uh, all the way through verse 9, it keeps talking about that we're supposed to be talking about our Father, thinking about our Father. Verse 4, your Father who sees in secret. Verse 6 of chapter 6, our Father who sees in secret and is in the secret place will reward you openly. Wow. And that's the one in verse 9 that we pray to as our Father in heaven. Now, what is he like? Well, look at chapter 10, verse 29. He knows each hop of every bird. Matthew 10, 29. Jesus was in the business of introducing people to his Father, the one on the throne, the one who is the most powerful being, the creator, the redeemer, and the judge. Jesus, God the Son, revealed him as. But look at 10:29. It says, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? Now that talks about the power of God. But you know what's really interesting? Looking up the Greek word for fall. This isn't talking about the sad thing that happened two days ago here. Uh, we had a bird. We were sitting in our chairs looking out the window, and all of a sudden the bird was coming dead on to us, and we've never seen one come so hard and he hit the window and it killed him and he fell to the ground and we didn't even know we thought he flew away until the next day and there he was sitting outside our house on the ground by the window dead that's not what this word fall means die god knows yes when every bird dies but it's literally the word hops god is aware of every time a bird hops on the ground. Have you looked out? It's springtime. They're hopping everywhere. God says he knows each hop of every bird, and he's the one in chapter 6 that tells us how to approach him. And that's the whole essence of the Lord's Prayer, that we come to the God who is on the throne. He is our heavenly Father, and in Matthew 6, he's our connection to the center of the universe, to the control center. Well, what is the book of Revelation? See the next slide? It's the map of the future God, our Father, has left us in his word. God says, I want you to be completely focused on doing what I left you on earth to do. You're headed to heaven, so to be absent from the body is better by far. I'm showing you where you're going. I'm going to right all wrongs. I'm going to return and rule on this world. I'm going to finally mete out all the judgment for all those who have ever gotten away with it and never fully been held accountable for their sin, and I'm going to spend forever with you in heaven. See, that's the map of the future, and those are the events the Lord tells us about. Starting in verse 6 of chapter 4, and let's, let's keep working our way through every verse. Remember, there are 404 verses, and we have to keep plowing through each one. Chapter 6 tells us what happens each time we worship. Uh, remember I said two classes ago that Easter Sunday that, that we recently celebrated, there were more people worshiping God than ever in history of the universe. 
Do you know why? It's because all those who die are absent from the body and they're present with the Lord. The group around the throne is growing every day, fast. And on earth it's growing too as we share the gospel. But look what happens when all of us are worshiping, starting in verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. In the midst of the throne, around the throne, were four living creatures. And then it describes in verse 7, these are the four-faced cherubim. And verse 8, the four living creatures have six wings, they're full of eyes, they do not rest, but say, holy, 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 verse 8. And verse 9, whenever they give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down. Now, for just a second, what, what is this 24 elders, okay? What is that talking about? Well, here's the throne of God in heaven. There are four of these cherubim that are flying around this throne. I call it theocentric orbit. The, the throne is in the center, and they're flying around the throne like this. Then next, uh, directly in front of the throne, there are these seven flames of fire, which the Bible describes as the archangels. We know two of them, Gabriel and Michael. So we know Gabriel and Michael, and there are five others. We don't know their names. So four cherubim, seven archangels, throne of God. Then the next thing around the throne are these 24 little thrones that are seated in a circle around this throne. And these are called the 24 elders. Now what what would that, what group is that? Who are they? Well, the Bible doesn't name them, just like we don't even know all the archangels, and certainly we don't know the names of any cherubim except one. Now, you know one cherubim, one cherub, Satan. When he was Lucifer, he was a cherub. So we know the name of one cherub, we know the name of two archangels, we know the name of none of the elders. But I will give you a little, little idea of who they might be. Because heaven has this merging of two groups of 12. There are the 12 gates of heaven and the 12 foundations. And the 12 foundations are the apostles and the 12 gates are the tribes of Israel. So it appears the 24 represent all the gathered people of God. The Old Testament, the uh, 12 tribes, Israel, uh, the, the chosen people of promise, and the New Testament church, 12 apostles. So it appears these 24 represent us. And why would we say that? Because the only time 24 occurs in the Bible is 24 courses of priests, of which uh, Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, was one of them. There are 25, 24 courses of priests in the Old Testament. And then we learn from Peter that we are a chosen nation, a holy priesthood. So it's almost like the 24 elders represent the holy priesthood of all believers, old and new, merged together around the throne. But what's amazing, when these come around the throne, Paul explained that we're to set our affection on things above. What's he talking about? We're supposed to be longing to be a part of this representative worship of God seated on his throne, connected to what's going on in heaven. Let me just give you a little bit of the wonder of the scriptures. If you go to Ezekiel chapter 1, see the slide in front of you? It says God's throne, this throne right here, is surrounded by clouds of raging fires. That's Ezekiel 1, verses 4 through 6. Then it says there are sparkling ones, these angels here, that surround the throne, reflecting the light. It says in Ezekiel 1, 13, that out of the throne proceed lightnings. So there are lightning flashes coming out of the throne and peals of thunder. Now, that's what Ezekiel 1, 13 to 17 says. And that's exactly what we see in Revelation 4 and 5. It's one of those 800 allusions. 
Also, it says God's throne is surrounded in Ezekiel 1, 18 and 19 by highly intelligent beings covered with eyes. Oh, wait, look at chapter four. And it says in verse six of Revelation, and around the throne, there's a sea of glass like crystal in the midst of the throne. Around the throne were four creatures full of eyes. Remember these right here, these cherubim? Those are the same ones that are in Ezekiel verses 18 and 19 of chapter one. And then it says that the surface that all these thrones are sitting on and these angels are standing on is crystal and it's reflecting all this light, glistening crystal that reflects and refracts the light of his glory. So we could summarize and say God's throne is surrounded by these huge sounds, all these flashes of lightning, and it sparkles like a burning fire. Now there are a couple, that's what I just described to you is what's here in Ezekiel chapter one. Do you know what Daniel adds to it in chapter seven, in chapter nine, in chapter 10? He talks about the fact that there is a river of fire so coming right out of the front of the throne is this river of fire that flows out from beneath the throne. So a pavement of glass, a throne that is flashing lightning, peeling with thunder, surrounded by these flying angels, these seven standing angels, these 24 elders. By the way, the next layer right here, it has all the redeemed of all time. They're the next row and it keeps growing. Then there's a outer row. Now the, the geography I know that explains how big this is, is right here. Does anybody recognize this state? That's the state of Michigan. Okay. Anytime you see Michigan, it looks like a hand, a mitt. If you took how much space it would take for hundreds of millions of people to stand far enough apart so they can get down on their faces and then get back up and keep doing that all the time. On a map, it would take an area about the size of the lower peninsula of the state of Michigan. That's the geographic area, the size of the area surrounding the throne. So what we're saying is this is a, incomprehensibly large area. Why does that matter? Let's go to Romans 14, 10. Remember, all the Bible's reflected in the book of Revelation. What does Romans 14, 10 say? Well, it says that every one of us have an appointment to go to that throne. And this is what it says in Romans 14, verse 10. Why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all paristemi, that's the Greek word, stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The slide you see in front of you is the, the earthly representation of that throne because the word Paul chooses to use for that throne is the word in Greek, bema. So he said, we're all gonna appear before the raised bema, of Christ. So this throne right there, the throne of God in the Bible is called the Bema or Bema. Paul says, we're all going to appear before that place. Now the next slide, 2 Corinthians 5.10 tells us that we are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of our life. And so that's second Corinthians chapter uh, five, verse 10. And then Paul already said in first Corinthians three and 10 to 15, that this river of fire I told you about, we're going to stand on one side and Christ is going to stand on the other side. And we get to push our shopping cart everything we've done in our life with the sin removed, everything we've invested our time in, all the time we spent doing anything that wasn't sin because sin is erased. So all that we did that wasn't sin, 
is our shopping cart. That's the works of our life. And we push it into this fire. It says that it will go through the fire. And whatever doesn't burn up is what we give to Jesus. It's kind of like the sum of our life. Wow. Do you see why this throne is so important? Do you, do you see why the early church, they couldn't get enough of this? They had so many messages about, about the church on earth, what they're supposed to do, the church in heaven, we're going to get ready for that. Don't worry about all the evil in the world. God's going to handle that. Jesus is coming back. He's going to rule. He's going to give everybody their reward. And we're headed to our home he's prepared for us. So what do we see in heaven? We see that throne with the river of fire, Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10. We see the sea of glass, that flat surface, Revelation 4 and verse 6. We see these living and burning ones, these angels. We see the 24 elders. We see the countless angels in the, the concentric circles around there. And then Paul said, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in his body, your shopping cart, to put into the river of fire. According to what we have done, whether it's good, that means it lasts, or it was just worthless. That means it wasn't sin. You know, there's nothing wrong with collecting stamps. You can't take them to heaven. They'll burn up, okay? There's nothing wrong with being a great sportsman and having all kinds of trophies. Being a great businessman, having all kinds of awards. But those things aren't the currency of heaven. They were just things we could do with our life on earth. The reward is what Jesus said that we did as a good and faithful servant. Now I want to close with this. How do we get ready to stand before God's throne? I mean, the whole fourth and fifth chapter, this class and the next class is all about how we are going to appear before that throne. But how do we get ready for that? Back to Matthew. Let's conclude in Matthew, okay? Because Jesus explains it, and I think most of us have not connected Matthew chapter 6 with this scene. Okay, so how do we get ready? God wants us, listen to this, chapter 6 of Matthew, verse 9. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father who art in heaven. Now, wait a minute. What what does it say we're supposed to do in our prayer? Number one, the first thing we do every time we pray is we focus on the throne where our Heavenly Father is seated. That's verse 9 of Matthew 6. How do we get connected to that throne? We say, Lord, focus me on the fact that right now you're sitting on the throne, you're surrounded by all these angels and lightning and fire and, and countless, you know, inexpressible, as Ezekiel describes, sights. Focus me on that. Focus me on the fact that you're running the universe, the, that you created it all, and that all you want me to do is to submit to you. That's my spiritual worship. That's the first. Our Father, see on the screen, focus me. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Number two, control me. Thy kingdom come. Martin Luther said this is a terrible petition. Do you know what he meant? He said every time you say that, thy kingdom come, you're inviting God to control your life. Did you know we're supposed to every day pray in this manner? The Lord says, after this manner, verse 9, pray. We're supposed to pray without ceasing. God, focus me on your throne. And as I'm watching that, I submit to your control. That's what my worship is. I say, control me. And then, thy will be done. You all know this this Lord's Prayer. It's the most well-known portion of Scripture in the Bible. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, which is another way of saying lead me. Number four. Next slide. Supply me. Give us this day our daily bread. Notice it says daily. That means I need the Lord. I keep close in touch with him to supply me. It's kind of like my cell phone. It wears out. 
Uh, if I use it heavily, it can wear out in less than a day. As a, as a believer, I need to be connected to the Lord, to the most powerful place in the universe, for him to focus and control and lead and supply me. And then notice what it says next. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You know what that is? Cleanse me. I don't want any sin in my life that separates me. Uh, do you remember the other day I wrote down here that we can grieve and quench the Holy Spirit? Wow, cleanse me. I don't want to grieve or quench you. And then lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Do you know what we're supposed to constantly ask the Lord? To protect us. If we realize how powerful the devil is, we know the only protection comes through Christ. Protect me from the evil one. And then here's the crescendo of the Lord's Prayer, which says, for thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. You know what that means? It's all about you. So I want you to empty me of thinking life is all about me. Empty me from filling my shopping cart with all about me stuff. That's all going to burn up because I want Jesus to be the sum of my life. That's how we stay connected to the most powerful place in the universe. And that's how we do what the Lord says. That's how we focus on our father who's sitting on the throne. And the writer of Hebrews put it this way, we do not have a high priest that can't sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace and mercy that we can find help in our time of need. Wow. That's the message of Revelation 4 and 5. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word to our hearts. Father in heaven, we bow before you. Focus me on your throne as you sit there in the serenity and the beauty of the worship on the throne of the universe. And then I pray you would control me and lead me through life. Supply me with the grace and help for today because I want to need you every day. Cleanse me as I am the worst sinner that I know personally in the whole world. Cleanse me so I don't grieve or quench you. Protect me from the evil one. And I pray that you would empty me so that you can fill every part of my life. That's the message that stirred the hearts of the early church and that keeps each one of us on target every day of our life. That's what we ask for in the name of Jesus and for his glory. And all God's people said, amen. Mm -hmm.